This morning we're starting a new sermon series that is dealing with our family, focusing on the family, allowing that to become something important to us. Over the next seven weeks we're going to be looking at different things that the scripture is telling us to do with our families and how we need to make God the central part of that. You know, throughout my years of ministry, literally, there have been thousands of people who have come to me and ask, they'll, they'll begin and they'll say, Pastor, I've got a problem. I need to talk with you. And then as they begin to talk about that problem, that problem I begin to realize is not about them personally. It's they've got a problem with their wife. Or they've got a problem with their husband. Or they've got a problem with their teenager. Or their unruly child. They've got a problem with somebody in the family. And, and they'll sit there and they'll begin to talk about it. And sometimes it's really rough problems. I remember one particular woman com coming to me one day and just saying, Pastor, I've got a huge problem. My husband has had adultery. How do I deal with that? How do we, how do we work through this and salvage our family? A parent coming to me and saying, Pastor, my child has decided to live an alternate lifestyle. How do we walk through this? How do we deal with this? Not saying that the problems with the other people is not important or that it's not a big issue, but one of the things I've always done is we first have to move the focus on the right thing first. I find that you and I really, I mean, if, if I want to change my wife, I can't really do that very well. What, if she wants to change me, she can't do that very well. But I do know this, that if I am in a relationship with God and she's in a relationship with God, then I can allow God to change her and she can allow God to change me, and that can happen more dramatically than we would ever imagine. So, what we want to do this morning is I want us to think about if we're going to focus on the family, we've got to begin with the right focus. And where I will take couples that I'm counseling or individuals I'm counseling and I'm saying you can't necessarily change them until you personally are focused on the right things. Because sometimes in our life we get off focus. We get, we get to doing things that are important. Some of you and, and me, we, we get to doing things that are important, but they're not focused on the right thing. I want us to look uh, at Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And you're going to go, well, what does this have to do with family? And at the end of this message today, I hope you understand very clearly what it has to do with family. And he, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, if I'm going to focus on my family to change my family or influence my family in a very positive way, then I've got to first make sure that, that my first love is right. Because, folks, nothing is right until our first love is right. I watch as couples come in for counseling and they're, they're wanting to get married. They're in love with one another. Man, they're so much in love with one another, they can't see a single problem being a problem. And, and they look and they go, oh, it doesn't matter if he, if he does really weird things, like keep his socks laying on the couch. You know, it doesn't matter if he does put the toilet paper on the roll the wrong way. It doesn't matter about any of those things. I love him. And, and, and she'll have the same types of quirks and, and he'll love her. And they'll walk down the aisle. You know, we'll watch that beautiful bride come down and they'll stand here on the, on the platform and I will ask the bride and the groom to make vows to one another where they say, I'm going to love this other person, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're sick or healthy, whether they're good 
or bad. I'm going to love them with everything I've got till death and death alone separates us. And that all sounds good. And it's important. But one of the things I talk with the couples about before they ever walk up here is that if the husband loves his wife with all his love and passion and the wife loves the husband with all her love and passion and God is not the first love of that family that family will miss out on what their life can be because see if I'm loving my wife with everything I've got and she's loving me with everything you've got and, and we're not loving God first, then we're going to miss out. We're going to go opposite directions. And you watch families fall apart. And you, you watch families that, that come apart in that whole process. Now, I know that we're told so many things in our, in our world that sometimes we've, we begin to believe. Uh, one of the things I look at is we're told, at least we're told in the United States, about 50% of all marriages in the United States end in divorce. And we're told, or were told for a long time, that uh, that includes Christian marriages. So basically you look at it and go, 50% of Christian marriages end in divorce, Christian percent of non-Christians marriage end in divorce, and so it's just basically a wash. It really doesn't matter whether you believe in Jesus or not because it's all the same and you'll see that information out there and you'll hear it touted and everything but you know what some researchers began to really look at the numbers and they found out that that's a lie that is not true do you know if a person loves Jesus Christ as their focal point as a husband and a wife and the husband and the wife are praying together and the husband and wife are seeking God's will in their life and the husband and wife are coming to church together, and they're giving God glory in their family, do you know what the likelihood of divorce is? It's less than 5%. Matter of fact, some studies would say it's even less than 1%. You know what? Loving Jesus first makes a huge impact on your family. You can't love something else first. Some of you have decided, this husband of mine is not able to be loved completely, and I really can't have a relationship with him, and I really can't do anything well with him. So what I've done is I've substituted my relationship with my children. My children are the focus of my family, and they're my first love, and they're the ones, you know, after all, they're the future. You know what? Those kids have no future if you don't. Those kids have no understanding of life if you don't place it there. And so, you know, you and I sometimes substitute our children for that first love. Some of you have even gone outside of that. The husband will say, you know what, this wife is not really easy to get along with. She's a problem. And so I, I've, I've given her, you know, I'll pay the bills. I'll give her money. I'll take care of things. I'll provide for her. But when we have a nice dinner, we want to do that with our coworkers, not our family. Our work has become our first love. And we can very easily say, you know, I've got this meeting that goes over, and I've got this other thing that goes over. And, and you know, our life becomes so focused on our work that our work becomes our first love. We need to understand that we've got to get this first love right in order for us to be able to focus on our family right. So how do we do that? How do I get my first love right? Because, you know, the Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. We're going to see how dramatic of a love that is as we move forward. If I'm going to get my first love right, then there's some things I need to understand. I need to first understand that God loves me and He has a plan for me. 
He loves me tremendously. Jesus died on a cross for us. He gave his life for us. In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. When we look at this passage that we started out the sermon with, it says it's the beloved Son that has changed the whole nature of who we are. Jesus loves us. He loves us completely. He loves us no matter what is going on in our life. And he says that he has come that we may have life and that much more abundantly. So if, if I'm going to get my first love right, I've got to understand it's Jesus that loves me more than anything or anyone else. You know what? Your job may say, oh, we love you. We love you. We can't do without you. But you have a heart attack and die. And you know what? Your work doesn't miss a beat. Not a beat. You know what? They look at some other person in the same office and they go, oh, we love you. Take over his work. And never even think about you again. I remember my dad making the comment, the hardest thing about retirement was that he went from indispensable to unneeded instantaneously. Wow. If you're going to love your work more than your family, I'm going to I want you to understand, your work one day is not going to need you. Your family is always going to need you. And you need to love them. And you need to love God with all your heart. The thing we need to understand also is that if I'm going to get my first love right, I need to understand that my rebellion separates me from God. And we are rebellious. We are people who have to get our own way, do it our own way, think about it our own way. We're the ones who are always right in the relationship, right? I mean, when you're arguing with your spouse, is your spouse wrong or you? It's always the other person. You may go, well, you know, I, I may have a fraction. You know, out of 100%, I may be 5% wrong. When in reality, if you were to lay it out, you're 50% wrong, they're 50% wrong, but you're not willing to give, and they're not willing to give, and your stubbornness is basically saying, I'm willing to just let this fight keep on. You know what? God is 100% right. We're 100% wrong in the rebellion. God loves us. And he says, hey, I've got a desire for you. But the scripture tells us in Romans 3.23, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us are short of what he wanted. You know what? Those same couples that come up here and get married who are deathly, I mean madly in love with one another, who cannot see each other's faults, who could not ever think of not loving that other person, 18 months later are in my office going, what happened? Who did I marry? What in the world is going on? You know what? Why? Because they failed to live up to the expectations of another human. Well, here's what I want us to understand. We all have failed not to live up to the expectations of God because the expectation gives the idea that somebody's asking or wanting or thinking something that you may not possibly be able to do. But God knows exactly what you're capable of. He's requiring of you exactly what is that requirement. And he says every one of us fell at that point. Jeremiah says our heart is deceitful and it's wicked more than anything else. And the wages of sin is death. But you know there's something wonderful too. The third thing we need to know if we're going to get our love right is we need to know that Jesus died for my sins. Jesus died for my sins. This passage says that he has rescued us from the domain of darkness. 
He has rescued us in that he has paid for my sins. He didn't overlook my sins. He's paying for them. He's under, and it's the, the idea of this is a done deal. And it's, and it's so neat. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4 says, Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. You know, Jesus died so that he could pay for my sin and your sin. But yet at the same time, Jesus didn't stay dead. If I go and I... Let's think of somebody famous. I mean, if you're, if you're a pianist, you may think of Beethoven. I mean, that's a... Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, most of us have. You know what? He died. Yeah. And you can go and, and, and talk about his grave, and you can see that. You know, I can look back and I can see, you know, there's some famous people in the past that, that I admire, and the thing, thing is, I can go to their grave. You know what? If you go to Israel today, you can go to the grave site of Jesus, but not the grave of Jesus. There's a huge difference. A grave site where he was laid temporarily because Jesus didn't stay dead. Jesus came alive. And in that, he paid for our sin debt. He rescued us. He gave us spiritual delivery from all the issues that were in our past. And you know what is interesting? When Jesus pays for your past and my past, it's final. It's done. It's over. That's hard for us to imagine because it's like recently I was talking with someone and they made the comment that their wife made a statement to them and all of a sudden they had a flashback to an argument 12 years earlier that was very hurtful. And it's an argument that they forgave their spouse for. But he said, all of a sudden, I was right back there. And I have to remember, I forgave her for that statement. I forgave her for what was going on. But man, in my heart, all of a sudden, I was right there. I want us to understand that when Jesus forgives us of our sins, when we are forgiven, it is done away with. God's not, Jesus isn't sitting there going, well, you know, you have messed up for the 584th time in this one area. That's not to even account for the other 1,084 in the other area. I'm keeping a record here, you see. Jesus isn't doing that. He says when he paid for our sin debt, he eliminated it. It wiped it out. So, we've got that. And we need to allow God to under, to, to, we need to accept his payment for our sin. Then if I'm going to focus on that first love, I can focus on my first love on Jesus. I can focus my first love on Jesus and receive God's forgiveness. God forgives us. We struggle to forgive ourselves. And we struggle to forgive those people around us. We're actually more forgiving of ourselves than we are those people because we understand why we would mess up if we had to live with somebody like that. But yet, in the, in the same time, we struggle with being able to forgive, just like the person I talked about, you know, the 12-year-ago conversation. And here's one thing that's interesting. In all my years of talking with couples or individuals, when, when I sat there and, and I, in our conversation, I could sit there, I could hand them a piece of paper, and I could say, write down something you think needs to be changed in that person's life or something that's not right about that person. You know what? They're usually writing so fast, there's smoke coming off the page. It's like... <laughs> Preacher, I'm at number 430, and I'm out of paper. You know. But then if I were to ask them, 
to write the good things about their spouse at that moment. Here's what happens. Okay, number one. Ah, yes, number one. Give me time. I'm going to think of something. You know what? And we look at it as if that's the way God looks at us. But I want you to understand, when we receive the forgiveness of God, God looks over on the negative side of our page, and He doesn't see anything. He's going, that's paid for, that's done, that's wiped out. The blood of Jesus Christ has covered that. It's a done deal. Now let me tell you some wonderful things. You're in a great relationship with me. All these things are going on and here's what can happen and what should happen in our walk together. What a powerful thing for us to recognize that our God loves us. That our God recognizes that we fail and He just doesn't walk away from that as if, well, I can focus my attention on something else. Our God instead of walking away, paid for our sin. And He gave us the opportunity for forgiveness. And you may, you, you, to receive forgiveness. And you may kind of go, but what does that have to do with focusing on the family? Well, the reality is, is I can't get my focus on others right till I get my focus on me right. When I begin to understand who I am in Jesus Christ, it says in 1 John chapter 9, or chapter 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's powerful. God has said, I am cleansing you. Now, how does that affect what happens from then on? Well, the effects of getting my focus right are first that I have a new authority in my life. When it says that He removed us from the darkness, the domain of darkness, it's the authority of darkness. That He's removed us from the authority that darkness has. It's the idea of He's revoked the license of Satan to condemn us. There's been something very exciting that's been happening for our Filipino church group out in Tin Moon. They've met for years in a building that's been owned by two different individuals or part of it's owned by one group, part of it's owned by another group. And, and uh, there's always the, the emphasis there, one's a Christian, one I'm not sure if the other's a Christian or not, but we're, we're always dealing with rent raises and, and conflicts and, and everything like that in relationship to that. But about three weeks ago, they began worshiping in their new space because we talk to them about, hey, you need, a, you need a better space. You need a bigger space. You need a space where you can grow and where you can minister and, and do something different. So we helped them and we rented a new space. They began worshiping in that new space three weeks ago. And it is absolutely amazing. But you know what? What if today, during the worship service, the old landlords were to go into the worship service and after the worship looked at Pastor Rodolfo and says, you know what, you've got to get out of this building. What would he do? He'd kind of look and go, what do you mean? You're the landlords from the other place. You have nothing to do with this building. This isn't yours. You don't have any authority here. You can't tell us that we have to leave. We've got a new landlord. He's very pleased with us, and everything's working fine, and he's the one that will make the decisions. You know what? When this scripture says we are removed from the domain of darkness, it says Satan no longer has the ability to come into your life and force you into anything. Period. You're free of that. God has given you something very, very special. The darkness legitimately cannot hold any power over you. And your focus can be on the right things. Paul told us in the Philippian letter, 
that he, talking about Jesus, who began a good work in us, will perfect it until the day of Christ. Wow. Our citizenship isn't here anymore. It's in heaven. When we have a relationship with God, we're freed from all of that. The second thing is, I have a powerful new relationship. Now, in this new relationship, it says here, it says that we are transferred, we're rescued from the domain of darkness, and we're transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, it's interesting, most of the time when Paul talks about being transferred into the kingdom of heaven, most of the time when Paul talks about the, the concept of, of our future life, it truly is he's talking about something in the future. Like after we die. Many times when he's speaking, he'll, he'll talk about how Jesus is very real in our life right now, but there's some ultimate blessings that are coming way out here after we die. But that's not what it says here in Colossians. In Colossians, Paul is trying to help them understand that this transfer into the kingdom of God is right now. It's immediate. On the day we give our heart and life to Jesus Christ, we become participants in a new relationship. We are the sons of Christ. We're the sons of God. We are like the firstborn son. Now, that's not a huge deal in, in our world today in many of our societies. But in biblical days, if, let's say there were ten boys in the family. The firstborn son got two-thirds of absolutely everything. And son two through ten had to equally share the other third. Kind of tough, isn't it? But did you know what? The Lord says the type of relationship he brings us into is one where we are all just like that firstborn son. We get that blessing. And I think it's really interesting here too when it says, <clears throat> in whom we have redemption. There's a different relationship there. Because the idea of redemption is not that you go to the slave market and you buy a slave. But when you went to a slave market in those days and you redeemed a slave, you were redeeming him to freedom. So you were making that slave a free man. Jesus is saying, hey, in the new relationship you have, you're not held in the bondage of Satan. You're not held in the bondage of sin. You're not held in all this. You are free to be that new person in that new relationship with Christ completely. And in Christ, we have that relationship. In Him, we're called the chosen people. We're called a peculiar people. His personal possession. We're called those who are, are the sons of God, the children of God, the heirs of God. All those things have completely come about. Okay, and then lastly, the last effect I want us to know is that I can love my family because of Jesus. Because see, when I look at my life based on what Jesus has done for me, when I am, when I am talking to my wife and she's disappointed me, I can understand how God has dealt with me. And then I can deal with her in the same way. She can do the same thing to me. Because you know what? Every one of us have disappointed each other, haven't we? Every one of us have at times said, you know, I'm not really interested in my wife or my husband today. I'm going to replace it with family, my children, my work, something else, my club. I'm going to replace it with something. We've all been there. But when we understand the love of Jesus Christ, that Christ says, hey, look, 
even though you failed me, even though you went against me, even though all these things were wrong, I'm going to see you differently. If we were to go back to when you were dating as married couples, those for you married couples, those of you who are currently dating, you're right here right now. But let's say back in your days of dating, your, your wife and you, you were trying to figure some things out. Now, in my marriage relationship, my wife fell in love with me the first time she saw me. Everything was fine from then on. <laughs> Actually, my wife fell in love with me when I was preaching a revival at a church, and she was singing that night. And the next morning, she went to her place of work, and she told her secretary that she had met the man she was going to marry. She just didn't know how that was going to work. Because she lived about 12 hours away from where I lived. So that was kind of an interesting deal. But you know what? What if in our relationship or what if in your relationship we had been where we had been dating each other, we had been trying to love, uh, show each other that we loved each other and those types of things and, and, and you just kept getting hurt every time you turned around. Somebody would say things bad about you or, or somebody would treat you wrong or somebody would say you're not interested in what you're doing then you know what isn't it funny how when you're dating somebody will say do do you like this and they'll go oh yes and they'll do it right up until they get married and then after marriage you'll say let's go do this and they'll say I don't want to do that why I hate it well, why did you do it? Because I wanted to win you over. I love you. You know what does something? God's not like that. God truly does love you deeply. And even though you and I disappoint Him, He's going to love us. He's more like the prodigal son's father, the loving father, who's there with his arms wide open and it says, I am so glad you're back. So this morning, I want you to know that for those of you who are Christians who have left God being your first love, you know honestly that your family is your first love. You know honestly that your spouse is your first love or your job has taken over the, the place of God in that. This morning, I ask you to recommit yourself to God and say, God, in order for me to understand and benefit for going forward and make my family strong, I want to get my focus right, and I want you to be focused on first. Those of you who don't know Jesus Christ, I invite you to focus on Him. He's loved you. Even when you're disappointed, or he's dis, dis, he, you've disappointed Him, He's loved you. He paid for your sin, and He's offering you forgiveness. Would you give your heart to Him? And then I want you to understand that as you and I are allowing God to love us, we can begin to love others that same way. It's a new relationship. It's a new time. It's a new day. And we have Him living in us to help love others. This morning, would you make a commitment and surrender yourself to Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have rescued us from the authority of of darkness and that you've given us the present relationship in you that you've redeemed us set us free you've forgiven us of our sins and Lord may we focus on you in such a way that you can begin to impact in a very positive way, how we treat our children and our wives and our husbands. That we love them. Guide us and direct us in Jesus' name. Amen.